it is now my honor to introduce our next speaker. Mr. Ron O'Rourke has worked as a Naval Analyst for the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress since 1984. During nearly four decades, he's authored innumerable reports and briefed and testified to Congress on topics relating to the Navy, Coast Guard shipbuilding, China's naval forces, U.S.-China strategic competition in the South and East China Seas, U.S. defense strategy, defense acquisition policy, the international security environment, and the Arctic. He has received significant awards and recognition for his vast body of work and contributions, including receipt of the Superior Public Service Award from the Navy for providing analysis of tremendous value. Mr. O'Rourke has authored several journal articles on naval issues and is a past winner of the U.S. Naval Institute's Arleigh Burke Essay Contest. A Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the Johns Hopkins University and a valedictorian graduate of Johns Hopkins Paul Nitze School of Advanced International Studies, we thank him for joining us again at Defense Forum Washington. Let's give Mr. Ron O'Rourke a warm welcome. Is a microphone on? Okay. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, and thanks for having me here today. I'm going to go through my slides pretty quickly, so be ready for that. Next slide, please. Uh, a quick note, this presentation will present some options, but it doesn't make any policy recommendations. Next slide. Here's my outline. Part one is something I did at the Surface Navy Association Symposium in January, and I was asked to repeat it at another meeting in February, I'm gonna do it again here for you. And part two is the new follow-on to that. So let's start with the first thing at the top about the future size of the Navy. Next slide, please. This graph, which plots the DOD data that I show in two of my CRS reports, is one way of representing the problem statement. Back in 2005, when I initiated my CRS report on China's Navy, some people asked why I was doing a report on that topic. As time went on, people stopped asking me that question. As these trend lines have formed, the situation regarding China's Navy relative to the US Navy has evolved from lack of awareness to awareness, from awareness to concern, and most recently, from concern to alarm. Next slide. In response to this situation, the Navy since 2019 has conducted studies for replacing the current 355 ship Navy force level goal, which dates to 2016 and is now outdated in multiple ways, with a new force level goal. The bottom line parts that I've circled are enlarged on the following slide. So next slide, please. As you can see, these studies have identified potential new force level goals that generally include something between 350 and 400 manned battle force ships. There would also be dozens of large unmanned surface and underwater vehicles. Next slide. Two key issues for enlarging the Navy to something like the figures in the Navy studies include administration endorsement of a new ship force level goal in that range and providing the funding to achieve that goal. Very importantly, funding would need to include not only money for shipbuilding, but also for the wraparound costs of operating and supporting a larger fleet. Increasing the shipbuilding budget without increasing the Navy's overall budget to pay for the wraparound costs wouldn't make the Navy bigger. It would instead make the Navy younger. Making the Navy younger could be of value in terms of increasing average ship capability and reducing average ship maintenance costs, but the fleet wouldn't be substantially bigger. Next slide. Regarding the first of these two key issues for enlarging the Navy, I don't see much evidence that the administration has explicitly endorsed a new force level goal for a fleet in the size range indicated by the Navy's studies. The administration over the last three years has had numerous opportunities to do that, but I don't see much evidence that the administration has actually done that. The national defense strategy is one place where that might have occurred, but the NDS includes no force level figures and no force sizing metric. 
The Navy's latest Battle Force Ship Assessment and Requirement Report was submitted to Congress in classified form only, with no plan to issue an unclassified version, which has limited public awareness and discussion of the study, and I didn't see the administration endorsing that study's force level goal. And the administration's 30-year shipbuilding plans don't present a clearly endorsed new force level goal for a fleet in the size range indicated by the Navy's studies. Regarding the other key issue, funding, the funded size of the Navy in the FIDIP continues to show the fleet remaining about the size it is today. Next slide. Here are three things that the administration has emphasized. These three initiatives have certain things in common. First, they can all be helpful. Second, they can mitigate the need for enlarging the traditional manned elements of the US military. And third, Discussing these items can leave less time for discussing the issue of whether to increase the traditional manned elements of the US military. Next slide. These three initiatives have prompted both supportive and skeptical responses. Here's an example of a skeptical perspective regarding integrated deterrence. I'll give you a moment to scan it, but you can look up the citation later to see it again, and you can see the the date at the bottom and where to go find that. So I think you're all fast readers and you're probably at least part of the way through. But you can go see the rest of it later by looking it up. Next slide. And here's an example of a skeptical perspective about working more with allies. The argument made here is summed up in the article's title, which is at the bottom. Next slide. This graph prepared by my CBO colleague, Eric Labs, shows how the actual size of the Navy shown in the black line has tended to fall short of earlier projections and remain relatively flat over time. Without an explicit administration endorsement of a new force level goal for a substantially larger fleet and the kind of increase to the Navy's overall budget that would be needed to support such a fleet, the black line here is not likely to bend substantially upward. Next slide. I want to shift now to the next part of my talk, which I first spoke about in January and February. It begins with some observed conditions regarding the Navy. Next slide. I've got three of these slides of these observed conditions, which are listed in no particular order. These are things that various observers have noted. On this slide, they include designing the fleet to some degree, one ship at a time, having expensive false starts, not optimizing the shipbuilding effort at the national level and not showing much emphasis on cross-class production engineering. Next slide. On the second slide, they include ad hoc, non-systematic moves toward modularity, open system architecture, and strategic outsourcing, limited leveraging of new labor markets, limited emphasis in platform acquisition on year-to-year ONS costs, and limited understanding of total future fleet ONS costs. Next slide. And on this third slide, they include mismatches between desired shipbuilding rates and repair needs on the one hand and industry capacity on the other, slow ad hoc responses to that situation, suggestions of passivity and helplessness about the situation, continued maintenance backlogs, and slow recognition of what might be structural and permanent changes in workforce conditions. Now, the Navy is clearly worried about a number of these conditions and is attempting to address them, but its efforts are often reactive, ad hoc, and whack-a-mole. And some of these conditions have become more like wallpaper, things that appear to be viewed as inevitable or immutable, accepted as normal, and not much noticed or commented on, even though that might not be correct. Next slide. The result of these conditions is lost time and money and reduced capability and capacity, even though we're in a situation of strategic competition with China. The Navy's about 78% of the DON budget, so the Navy's spending more than $180 billion a year. How much of that is not being spent as well as it might be because of these conditions? And what's the impact on deterrence and warfighting capability vis-a-vis -vis China? Next slide. There are likely several possible reasons for these observed conditions. One of them, the one I'm going to focus on, concerns the Navy's apparent incomplete use of design, and in particular that the Navy's design efforts don't appear to encompass broad-scale end-to-end design. Now, 
the Navy certainly does a lot of design work. It's designing things like ships and aircraft all the time. And the Navy sometimes engages in larger design efforts, but those larger design efforts cover only certain parts of the Navy, only certain parts of the force life cycle, and only certain building blocks of naval capability. There might be some people in the Navy who are doing what they call broad scale end-to-end -end design, but in terms of what I'm talking about, I've been looking for it for 39 years. I've never seen anyone point to it, mention it in a conversation, or incorporate it into any kind of briefing or presentation. Next slide. As for why the Navy's design efforts don't appear to encompass broad scale end-to-end -end design of the kind that I'm talking about, there are at least two main reasons. One is that it hasn't been seen as needed because the Navy had a post-Cold War luxury of time and capability overmatch, because limits on building blocks such as industrial capability were less of a concern, and because there was no competitor like China with capable technology, deep pockets, and determination. But the other reason has to do with training and work experience. This isn't the kind of design that a lot of people are trained to do or get a lot of practice doing, and so it might be dismissed as not possible or worth the effort, or its absence might simply go unnoticed, like a dog not barking. Next slide. So here are some options for addressing that situation and getting broad scale end-to-end -end design into the Navy. One option would be to get more of a clue about this kind of design by getting some exposure to how it's being done in other fields, including areas that have very little to do with the Navy. In other words, step outside the usual Navy application of design so as to better see the dog not barking. And one possible way to start would be to go to the place I'm gonna show you in a moment. For this part of my talk, you might wanna sit back Put your phone down and give your thumbs a rest for a moment. Next slide. I'm suggesting that you consider going here. As you know, museums nowadays aren't just places with lots of old stuff. A lot of them have transformed themselves in recent years into teaching institutions. Now, there are several design museums in this country, but the one shown here is the one in London. This is the one to consider going to, and not because some people consider it to be the leading design museum in the world, but because unlike other design museums, which, which tend to focus mostly on the design of objects, the design museum in London focuses, focuses additionally on design as a process, including broad scale end-to-end -end design. Next slide. Now, if you go to the Design Museum in London, you'll certainly find some familiar things, like the AK-47 as a case study in object design, or the standardized shipping container as a case study of a design innovation that changed the world. But that's not why you might consider going there. Next slide. You would instead consider going there because of its focus on design as a process including broad-scale end-to-end design, a focus that comes out in the museum's permanent overview exhibition called Designer, Maker, User, and in the book that the museum wrote about itself, which has the same title. I've included a few quotes from the book. If you want to choose just one to read, look at the first one, which I've underlined in red, and you'll begin to see why going to this place is something to consider doing for getting broad-scale end-to-end design into the Navy. But it's not just the overview exhibit that you would benefit from there. There are other things as well, and I'll show you a couple of recent examples. Next slide. This is Samuel Alif, a design engineer who was a designer in residence at the museum a year ago. His work during his residency, which was on display last year, was to redesign the agricultural system so as to reduce the release of excess phosphorus into lakes and rivers and thereby help prevent the poisoning of freshwater ecosystems. In the photo, you can see him pointing to a diagram of the current agricultural system. And on the right-hand side of the other photo, you can see his proposed new design, which resulted from his research. Elif isn't a farmer or an agricultural specialist or biologist. His undergraduate degree is in mechanical engineering. And this isn't art or aesthetics or object design. It's broad-scale, end-to-end design for addressing a complex problem. This was at the Design Museum. Next slide. And this is Bethany Williams, a clothing designer whose work was the subject of a major feature exhibit at the museum last year. The garment industry, as you know, is a huge and complex global industry with huge waste streams in the making of clothes and in what happens to clothes after they're made. A major focus for Williams for the 
the last few years has been to develop a new design for the garment industry that would be 100% sustainable. And that's a lot of what this major exhibit was about. Part of our new design is shown in the diagram on the right. You can see that quote from her in the upper right, which was on one of the display boards. Nobody's laughing now. She's now recognized as an emerging leader in her industry. If a 33-year-old menswear designer can do this for her industry, then some smart people in the Navy, and the Navy has a lot of them, can do it for the Navy. Now, both Life's project and Williams's were oriented towards sustainability, but that's not the point. The Navy would be doing this sort of thing for a different purpose. The point is the process they used. They both engaged in broad-scale end-to-end design to get at complex problems that needed addressing. This is what the Design Museum in London does a particularly good job of showing. So, one option to consider would be to get some exposure to broad-scale end-to-end design by getting on a plane and going to London. Next slide. Another option would be to get some outside help, because even after getting some exposure to this kind of work, it might still be helpful to bring in some people from the outside who do this kind of thing on a sustained basis. Next slide. And if you're looking for someone like that, I think a lot of people familiar with the field would first mention Bruce Mao, a designer who's been doing and teaching this kind of thing for about 30 years, and particularly in the last 20 years. Nobody embodies this more than him. His design consultancy works with major corporations, institutions, and governments at all levels. His projects have touched on things in the military domain. He has multiple books on the topic, including in particular the two shown here. He gives lectures on this all over the world. The one you see up top was in Sydney. He did at least one here in Washington several years ago. The room was packed, but I'm pretty sure that no one from the Navy's hierarchy was in the audience. If people in the Navy haven't heard of Bruce Mao, it goes to the point about getting more of a clue and the dog not barking. As you can see in the quote, what I've been talking about is something Mao refers to as enterprise design. And again, there may be people in the Navy who do what they call enterprise design. But what I've seen for the last 39 years falls short of the kind of thing I've been talking about and what Mao is talking about here in the three ways I mentioned earlier. So after flying home for London, you might consider booking another flight, this time to Chicago or Toronto, where Mao's organizations are based, and meet with him and his people. He might decide that he and his people can help, or at least point you to some other people who work in the field and can help. Next slide. After doing that, the people in the Navy who've gotten up to speed on broad scale end-to-end -end design can get together with some outside helpers and perhaps do something like this. It would start by honestly taking stock of the nation's building blocks for naval capability, what they offer in terms of strengths and opportunities, but also their limits and weaknesses. And then you would ask another question that hasn't received enough conscious, deliberate attention, which would be to examine how those building blocks are evolving and how they could be changed by Navy actions to be able to better support Navy needs. Next slide. So we're on 29 now. Yeah, we're in the right place. The building blocks would be in, on one side of the process and the desired product would be on the other. But the desired product isn't simply a static point solution, a navy with a certain number of ships of certain types and so on, like what I showed you earlier, though it would include that. It would instead be, more generally, an ability to generate, use, sustain, and adapt naval capability on a continuing basis and do so in the most cost-effective manner. Next slide. The process would ask the two key questions that you see here. The first one is about using the building blocks to determine the best possible design for the country to be able to generate, use, sustain, and adapt naval capability on a continuing basis. So building blocks to desired product at the national level. And the second question, the, wasn't, the one that doesn't get as much attention, goes in the other direction. It's about what the envisioned desired product can in turn suggest about Navy actions to adapt the building blocks where possible in a more systematic, proactive manner. Next slide. In simplified form, the process might look like this with the two key questions I just described being investigated in tandem. The process would be done in a periodic ongoing manner because the building blocks and the desired product would evolve over time. Next slide. Now, what I've described is just one possible approach. There are others. 
It wouldn't replace existing design, Navy design activities, which are important and need to keep happening. And it wouldn't be a silver bullet solution to the observed conditions I listed earlier because those conditions likely have several causes. Next slide. But it might help address those conditions in one or more of the ways I've listed here, which are basically the obverse of many of the conditions I listed earlier. Not considering some process of this kind could make the continuation of those conditions and the resulting losses of time, money, capability, and capacity more likely. Next slide. So that's what I said in January and February. The Navy listened, invited Eric Labs and me over for some follow-on talks, and two of their people even went to the Design Museum in London, although it, admittedly in one case it was because that person was already planning a family trip there. And the Navy has made some progress on some of the earlier observed conditions, particularly in terms of jettisoning the passivity and helplessness about limits on the industrial base. But the Navy still has a long way to go on the other items. After I gave my talk in January and February, I was asked what the process that I outlined might lead to in terms of possible options. And because of that, and because the Navy still has a long way to go, I'm going to finish my talk today by showing some potential options that might result from applying the broad scale end-to-end -end design process that I outlined in January and February. Next slide. A broad scale end-to-end -end design effort could begin by noting that the Navy is currently having trouble building ships, it's having trouble crewing ships, and it's having trouble maintaining and modernizing ships. So that's pretty much everything. And it would note that a building block that is contributing to all these difficulties is people. Labor shortages that in the early stages of the pandemic were thought to have been COVID-caused, acute, and temporary, now appear in the fullness of time to have instead been COVID-accelerated, secular, and permanent. People now appear to be a fundamentally more scarce resource, and not just for the Navy or DOD, but for US society as a whole. From large businesses right down to that little restaurant around the corner from where you live, you know the one I'm talking about, that has a help wanted sign on its window. Relative to all the things we want to do in our society, there just don't seem to be enough people to do them all. In this way, the ground has shifted fundamentally under our feet, and the Navy needs to fully recognize and respond to that. As my grandmother used to say many years ago, on this issue, the Navy needs to wake up and smell the coffee. Next slide. So if the Navy is having trouble with the three things I just mentioned, one option that might arise from a broad scale end-to-end -end design process would be to require people proposing new programs to show upfront and convincingly, not just in a pro forma manner, how their programs would help with one or more of those three problems and how, among other things, they would help with or form part of a larger effort to re-engineer the Navy to require fewer people for these three things. Compared to however this question is being used today, it would be brought forward to the front of the process, elevated to the top level, and the bar for getting a passing grade would be increased. Next slide. A second option that might arise from this process would be to move the Navy more systematically toward a kit of parts approach in which the fleet across the fleet, in which across the fleet, standardized components would feed into standardized systems that would be installed onto ready-to-go hull designs. The Navy's been moving toward this over time, but in an ad hoc, non-systematic, incomplete manner. The goal here would be to adopt a more deliberate and comprehensive approach to the issue and get away from doing bespoke, one bespoke ship design after another. Next slide. A third option would be to loosen up ship designs by not using size and weight as an absolute or strict proxy for cost, which it isn't, and instead to remember, and instead remember to keep your eye on the prize, which is to optimize the cost of building the ship, even if that means making parts of it a little bigger. This is what the South Koreans did do, as discussed in this 2019 Naval Engineers Journal article, and Sname and ASNI have talked about this. Eric Labs correctly points out that the Navy grossly exaggerated the cost-reducing effect of this concept to support unrealistic thinking about what it would cost to build the DDG-1000 design. But the concept has value when it's used properly. Next slide. 
A fourth option would be to move to federated shipbuilding, which you can think of as a more deliberate, systematic, and comprehensive application of strategic outsourcing on a much larger scale and across the fleet. The Navy is doing this with submarines. It did so to some degree with the DDG-1000 deck houses, and it did so in the LPD-17 program as a response to Hurricane Katrina. The idea would be to do this more deliberately and comprehensively across the fleet in an approach that might be called nation as a shipyard. Importantly, this could help the Navy access new regional labor markets that haven't been already tapped out in terms of their potential for generating workers interested in shipbuilding. Next slide. A fifth option would be to move toward continuous steady production by avoiding stops and starts, irregular drum beats, and changing annual quantities in shipbuilding efforts, which can be expensive in terms of money and lost time. The idea would be to avoid, among other things, production losses due to transitions between classes and the manicuring of procurement profiles in an attempt to precisely match downstream force level requirements. This is the approach that the Japanese take with submarines. They build them at a steady rate of one per year and then use service life to adjust force size. When they needed a force of 16 subs, they kept their subs for 16 years. When they increased their force level goal to 22 boats, they started keeping the boats to age 22. And as I've discussed in other contexts, they have the option of increasing the force size further to 30 boats by starting to keep the boats to age 30. Their planned force size has changed, but the subs are being produced continuously at the same steady rate. Now, I'm not suggesting that the Navy build ships with the intention of operating them for only half of their service lives. The application in the US Navy shipbuilding programs would differ. But the general idea is to keep moving in the shipbuilding effort and avoid interruptions and fussing with procurement profiles in the name of trying to precisely match force level goals because that's expensive and because time is an important building block and once it's lost, you can't get it back. Next slide. And finally, a sixth option that is related to continuous production would be to recognize the limits to knowledge in setting requirements for force levels and ship capabilities and consequently aim to get requirements for force levels and ship capabilities generally right, so as to avoid getting them exactly wrong. Precision in force level goals and required ship capabilities can be illusory in terms of both sensitivity to assumptions and durability of results over time. And chasing after that illusory precision with manicured procurement rates and bespoke ship designs can exact a cost that the Navy will be hard pressed to afford. If you need an alternate phrase for summarizing this option, you might refer to it as avoiding the fetishization of requirements. Next slide. So those are six options that might result from an application of the broad scale end-to-end -end design process that I outlined earlier, and here are areas they might help with. These are by no means the only possible options that might arise from a broad scale end-to-end -end design effort. Just some examples. A broad scale end-to-end -end design process would generate additional options, and you would need them to get more X's into the second and third columns. But whether you do any of these options or others, if you want to close up the trend lines I showed at the beginning in the problem statement graph, and if you want to effectively address the problems that the Navy is currently having, building, crewing, and maintaining and modernizing the fleet, it's hard for me to see that being very well done through only reactive, ad hoc, piecemeal responses. And that's why I've spent some time with you today focusing on broad scale end-to-end -end design. Next slide. So there you are. I don't want to focus only on problems. I'm looking for solutions. I think you are too. This was a gesture in that direction. I hope it helps. If you'd like to talk with me more about what I've shown here, please contact me. And of course, I'd be happy to address any other questions that you might have. So thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Good morning, Ron. Uh, thank you for 39 years of punching above your weight. I have a very simple question, followed by an explanation for why I ask it. The question is, 
who tasks you? I ask that because the last time that you and I were together, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, I came away believing that the 2023 NDAA change to the Navy's mission had had little or no impact on Capitol Hill, and that it was not in any way driving conversations. Um, my own experience is that I have learned that uh, at certain levels, OSD has directed that campaigning will not be a component of force structure. Are you able to do a report that looks at implementation of that public law? That's my question. Um, that kind of report, I think, is more in the lane of the Government Accountability Office, because their responsibility is to audit the execution of ongoing efforts, including executive branch compliance with congressional directives. So if Congress were to pass a provision, as they did in this case, that amended Title X in that area, and the question is, is the Navy following through on that? Then that is the kind of thing that GAO does when they audit and report back to Congress. So there are the three congressional support agencies. I mentioned Eric, who works for CBO. I'm at CRS. But the kind of thing you're asking about is in GAO's lane. Got it. Thank you. Sean Walsh. I'm a retired engineering duty officer, naval architect. I'm still involved with both ASNI and SNAMI. Uh, the technical societies as a volunteer. Several things kind of struck home. One question I had is on the kitting or cross engineering, it seems to be in the combat systems area, which is the most expensive part of combatant ship design. Uh, PEO IWS has gone there. A lot of stuff is common now across the classes with the SPY 6 system and Aegis based. Uh, the other thing you didn't mention, I was wondering mm -hmm. about, is the there's been discussion about the merchant, you know, lack of a merchant uh, fleet, commercial ship building base in the U.S. and how that drives up the warship costs, the combatant costs as well. I don't know if you wanted to discuss that or not. Right, yeah. I think you're referring back earlier to the kit of parts. And clearly the Navy has moved in that direction with some of its key systems. What I'm arguing is that if the Navy were to do that more so systematically and deliberately, uh, up front as part of a broad scale end to end design process, you'll do two things. First is you may discover opportunities for doing that that haven't yet been exploited. And second, you'll be paying more attention to how all these parts fit uh, into various potential hull designs so that you can get better cross class engineering. One of the things that really strikes me about our ship design programs is that when the Navy talks about a new ship design, they don't talk about the other ship designs and how those other ship designs might uh, relate to the new one that you're proposing or how it can all work together. So um, the Navy has clearly, as you indicated in your question, made progress toward that. Um, but I think there's a lot more ability to achieve benefits in that area through a deliberate upfront uh, process of the kind that I described. You're right, I didn't talk about Merchant Marine, didn't talk about uh, the Marine Corps either, and that's just due to limits on time and bandwidth for this. So. Uh, I'm going to hold off on launching into that uh, because um, it would be a big open-ended uh, and probably not very satisfactory answer to your question. Just say that, no, for this presentation, in part because I was following up what I did earlier, I limited it to the things that I did talk about. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I lost track of who was first here, so. Oh, okay. Uh, good morning, sir. Midshipman, fourth class, Masha from the Naval Academy. Um, do you see the Constellation class frigate program as a step towards the type of uh, shipbuilding redesign you're talking about using the proven uh, frame hole? Um, and do you, are you worried about scope creep on the program as it goes on before uh, the ships are actually built? Am I worried about what kind of creep? Yeah, uh, scope creep. Like requirements creep? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. I do consider it a pretty good example of using existing systems. So it fits into what could become a more systematic kit of parts approach in that way. And it started with, yes, the, uh, uh, the French-Italian hull design. Um, I don't consider that to be a design that necessarily reflects some of the other options that I mentioned. There's nothing wrong with that hull design. But if you were to take the options I um, mentioned here and run with them, then no, this hull design predates all that. So I'm not sure that it reflects that. For example, it's hard to know how there could be 
more than a certain amount of cross-class production engineering in a European hull design that's being brought into an American shipbuilding context. But yes, definitely in terms of using the existing systems, it represents a glimpse toward what the Navy could be doing more of. But if you were to do it more systematically, you would develop a family of designs, and you may have seen that part of the slide that I didn't talk to, of having uh, ready-to-go hull designs in various sizes so that you can mix and match to meet uh, requirements as your understanding of those things for what the Navy needs in the future uh, evolves over time in response to changes in the world. Intelligence, lifelong, dedicated to that mission. Uh, but I've also been involved in a number of other things, and I think some of those other things are underappreciated in this discussion. Uh, so I don't want the Navy to spend a lot of money or manpower doing these outside things but I think it should be aware to the possibility of getting inputs uh, from areas even beyond what you've mentioned. While I fully endorse your expanded view of uh, uh, thinking going into naval affairs. Uh, I, I would start uh, by saying, uh, do any of us think about the end point that we're after? And uh, the end point I'm thinking of is uh, the global civilian uh, human enterprise in, uh, at the end of this century and going into the century. And the reason I bring that up is that all of us, including our enemies, are part of the same problem, climate change uh, and other things about uh, effective use of the best of uh, new science, such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and like that. Uh, we don't think about those things, and the Navy should not be spending any funds in that area. But on the other hand, I would suggest we have free access, the Navy has free access to inputs from those areas that could be useful. Uh, you can't assign naval officers or even civilians to uh, do that, but you uh, can encourage uh, many Navy people, naval reservists and other uh, naval civilians who go into graduate school education to think about these things and look for areas outside the Navy that have implications that could be beneficial to the Navy. In that, I have been very, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the question is, how can we maximize our use of the non-naval resources that, uh, if we ask them, could contribute effectively to uh, parts of the Navy uh, planning and the Navy enterprise more generally that we're not currently looking at? Yeah, I think that the best way to respond to your question would, uh, would be to build on it and say that the, what I am suggesting here would not require the hiring of new people. It would just require directing their activities a little bit in this direction. Now, time is money, so if you spend time with existing staff to do this rather than something else, there's an opportunity cost. It's my contention that that would be a good investment because if you don't, you wind up wasting orders of magnitude, greater amounts of time and money and people downstream because you didn't do this kind of work up front. So that would probably be the best way I think I could build on the spirit of, of your remarks. Okay, next. Hi, Ron, Sam LeGround from USNI News. Um, who would be in charge of kind of this kind of revolution in, in total naval design here? Because you, what you're talking about cuts across a lot of different um, areas in terms of, uh, they, they have a lot of built-up inertia. Um, you know, when you have conversations with the Navy, who do they say would be in charge of an effort like this? Would this be an OPNAV responsibility or an AFSI responsibility? And how would you be able to overcome sort of the, kind of the, the, the three existing three-ring binders that are kind of dominating a lot of the uh, conversation around shipbuilding right now? Right. Uh, I can only give you a partial answer to that because 
I don't understand all the complexities of the Navy's own internal organization well enough to give you a complete answer. But I will tell you that the people in the Navy who listened in, in January and February and then brought Eric and me over, that was the N7 office, and the Admiral and his staff brought Eric and me over for those talks. I was at a meeting yesterday where it was suggested that people in the N9 office might have some role in this in terms of envisioning the future fleet. You could see that. But the third part of my incomplete answer that I will give you is that I don't think anything like this can happen unless there would be support or buy-in from the top of the Navy, from the Secretariat's office and the CNO. And that's because of the point you mentioned, which is that a lot of this cuts across various uh, offices potentially. No one would necessarily see it as their own thing and they are all very busy usually doing uh, their things from the bottom up ad hoc piecemeal fashion and they will not do this unless they are told to do it from somebody higher up. Could you speak to how your, uh, let's say, expansive design process would impact something as uh, statistically managed as, say, the fit up or the POM process? I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, could you explain how your design process uh, would impact something like the fit up or the POM process? Yeah. Um, no, I can't. <laughs> I, I can't explain how it would, uh, in part because what you just mentioned, again, is very complex and I'm not going to pretend to have a a great understanding of it. What I will say is that although it's expansive in terms of uh, the wide range of things that it would want to look at, it would still be a focused and limited activity when it began. It's a matter of having an attitude of going in and not launching into things unconsciously. How many institutions in this country spend $180 billion or more per year and only do it through bottom-up, ad hoc, piecemeal responses to the problems that occur without anything starting at the front end to say, what are we doing and is this making sense? That's what I'm saying. But, and, and I don't mean to make light of your question, but um, you know, I've looked at, at the POM process and PBBE and, and I understand that to a degree. And yes, the intersection of what I'm talking about with that is a little more than I could pretend to know right now. Hi, Pete Daly, Naval Institute member. Uh, a quick question, is there, could you give us even a sense of the receptivity for these kind of ideas on the other side, on the Hill? I mean, no flash traffic to you that we haven't had budgets, approved budgets. We're dealing with continuous CRs. And so much of what you said depends on continuity and dependability of those streams. Could you comment on the potential to receive this on the Hill? Right. I've pre presented this idea at professional conferences, so I can't speak to how people might react to it if I were to give it to congressional uh, members or staff or offices. And even if I knew that, my rules as a CRS analyst would prevent me from telling you the content of those reactions, because those would be privileged discussions. What I can tell you is that there is plenty of public support shown in the record for steady build rates and for uh, trying to get to regular drum beats and for putting uh, stability and dependability into the shipbuilding plan as a way of making shipbuilding. So that element of it, there's a long track record of Congress being aware of that and being supportive of it, that one part of it. And you can point to that in many places in the public record. So that's as far as I could take it. But I will say that um, in the way that I've presented it, I've done it at conferences like, like these. And so the audiences have been the people who come to, to uh, these kinds of events, which are largely Navy and industry and, uh, and related uh, uh, bodies of people. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for what you do. Ron, thank you so much. Uh, you have set up the next panel, and I think the other speakers coming uh, later today perfectly. Uh, and you've left, the f left us with a number of new ideas, uh, design, uh, and also I, I will walk into uh, the rest of my week with the phrase, 
what would Henry J. Kaiser do that will, that will resonate with me and I think with a lot of people here. I, I'm glad you noticed that. I didn't speak to that thing on the slide, but, but uh, the Navy has a, a great example in him among many other people right. uh, to go back and um, you know, recapture some spirit along those lines, yeah. Well, as a small token of our appreciation for your time today and your insights, we have a Naval Institute book, U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century by Captain Brent Sadler. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.